Hello, Bezel Triple Three. I'd like to ask the question Do people who die get a second chance to receive God's grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, in Hebrews 9 27, we read that it is appointed man once to die and then comes judgment. So let's look at a couple clips and then I want to look at the question Is there such a thing as a second chance for salvation? Now, life is precious. You can be feeling fine one minute the next, fighting just to live another day. Right now, Brad Feldman joins us with his special report. If everyone deserves a second chance, then just how many people are fortunate enough to get a third chance? Now, first off, I'd like to ask the question, where is that written, that everyone deserves a second chance? <laughs> On December 21st, 2007, the Ginthers were loading the car to head to a relative's for Christmas. They never made it. In fact... They never even backed the car out of the garage. At one point in time, she was dead, and uh, her husband brought her back. She had multiple periods where her rhythm was uh, very fast, very ineffective. Now in this incredible story of survival, this woman gets to the hospital and they realize they need to give her a procedure that's done at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So they stabilize her to the point where they're able to put her on an airplane and fly her over there. Tanya's condition improved and she made the flight to Rochester. However, while in flight, she died again. But did she really die in the biblical sense where you have the separation of the body and the soul if Hebrews chapter 9 is true? He probably owes you money, huh? Well, I'll ask him. He's dead. He can't talk. Look who knows so much, huh? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. Now, mostly dead... Is slightly alive. Now, all dead. Well, with all dead, there's usually only one thing that you can do. What's that? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. Now, without a doubt, this lady did receive a second chance at life. But what I want to talk about is a little different. I want to talk about the person who dies in the biblical sense, where the body and the soul actually separate, and this person has now crossed over into the next world. Can the person who has rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ get a second chance to embrace that gospel and be saved from their sin in the wrath of God? I think there's a couple of passages that are helpful for us. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 I think is very instructive. Now remember, this is a parable. It's not history. It's not reality. It didn't actually happen. But Jesus is teaching us the reality of what happens when a person dies? There's two destinations. Here's the, the seminal portion of that um, passage for us here. Uh, in, in verse 22, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels. And the rich man also died and was buried. So both of them died, and they're in two different places. Because we read next that in Hades... He, that is, the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger into the water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able. None may cross over from there to us. You see, there are two specific destinations for each and every person, and there is no crossing over. There is no second chance. Back to what we read in Hebrews chapter 9. It is appointed man once to die, and then comes judgment. And that judgment is final. Now the other passage that I think is helpful for us is a difficult one. 
It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 18. Now, this first portion of this passage is one of the clearest declarations of what Jesus actually accomplished here on earth. We read in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins. One time he did this. Not the uh, repetitive sacrifices that needed to happen continually in the old covenant of the sacrificial animals. Christ suffered once. The righteous Christ for the unrighteous, you and I, that he might bring us to God, restore us, reconciliation between ourselves, sinful humans, and God infinite holiness. Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now this is the human spirit of Jesus being um, made alive after he was crucified. Now something happens after that. He says, in which, Peter says, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now who are these spirits in prison? Well, because they, the spirits in prison, formerly did not obey when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now this could be, uh, well it has to be, either the people who lived in the time of Noah, who are now uh, apart from their bodies, waiting a judgment in uh, prison, the, the place of, of torment, waiting for judgment, or it could be spirits, meaning angelic creatures, perhaps those uh, angelic creatures that came down and had relations with women, if you go with that uh, interpretation in Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim, right? Uh, but the, the real question is here, was it Christ that went and proclaimed triumph as a king and potentate in Hades during the time when his human soul was separated from his human body, when he was in the tomb, or was it Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through Noah in his pre-incarnate state as Noah was proclaiming the truth of coming judgment? Remember in Second Peter, we read in chapter 2, if God did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah a herald or a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. You see, Noah was preaching repentance and judgment to come before the flood. But what we have here is two possibilities, but what we don't have is any indication that Christ went and preached a message of salvation for anyone who has already died and is awaiting judgment. Now, there's one other thing that we need to look at in this First Peter passage. It goes on, and it says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, and that is the waters of judgment and during Noah's time in the flood. Baptism now saves you, not as removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it always goes back to the gospel of what Jesus Christ accomplished, and baptism is just a physical sign of what was accomplished when Jesus lived, died, and rose again. It goes on, it says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. You see, Christ is our all and all. And my question to you is this, who are you trusting for your salvation? Who are you trusting as you transition from this world and into the next when your body and soul separate in death? You know, 2 Corinthians says this. It says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus Christ died for sinners, for people like me and for people like you. Today is the day to embrace that gospel because tomorrow's not guaranteed us. What is uh, guaranteed us is that we are going to die. It's one per customer in this world. And I urge you that if you don't trust in Jesus Christ, if you have not embraced the truth of the gospel as found in the, the four accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, do so today. Don't wait. Don't wait. Trust in him today. And you can know that you have eternal life with the creator of the universe and the redeemer of sinful people like you and me.